Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Learning at Lambda Labs. Uh, today's presenter is Millie, so I'll hand over to Millie. Great. Thanks very much, Tom. Um, I'll start presenting. Um, yeah, so my name is Millie Crowler, um, and today I'm going to be presenting on introspection and control flow in Python. So introspection in general is to turn your thoughts inward, um, to examine your own thoughts. Um, but in computing, it has a more specific meaning, which is um, the ability to examine the type of an object at runtime. So this isn't possible in, um, say, older languages such as C, um, and particularly compiled languages, because they usually discard type information at runtime. Um, Python, however, is a dynamic language um, which retains a lot of typing information um, through to runtime, which can be easily accessed um, if you want to know more about the type of an object. Uh, a related concept to this is reflection. So this is the ability of a program to um, inspect or modify its own structure or behavior at runtime. Um, and if you've used the get attribute function in Python, you've probably done reflection. You may not have thought of it that way. Um, but for example, the get attribute function um, is not at all possible in a language like C. Um, because, well, for example, the names of fields um, when they're compiled in C are, are lost. Um, they're not retained. And it's all converted into like um, memory addresses. So it's only in a dynamic language such as Python where the names of the attributes are retained and you can uh, dynamically get attributes. Um, and this is one type of reflection. Um, there's other also there's also other types that are within Python. Okay. Um, so I'd like to talk about one specific type of reflection today, which is um, specifically related to functions in Python. So every function in Python has this attribute called um, underscore code underscore. Um, and this um, object contains like a lot of useful information about the function. It contains um, the name of the function, for example here. Um, it contains a list of all the local variables um, and as well as the number of arguments, for example, or the, yeah, so a tuple of all the names and uh, all the local variables and parameters to a function. Um, so this can provide you with lots of useful information um, about a function. So I'd like to show um, what this looks like in action. So we're going to be starting off with a very simple function you've seen before, which is the factorial function. Um, it's a good one to use as, a, as an example, because everyone knows it. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Yeah, so the first thing we're going to do, <coughs> sorry, is access this um, underscore code underscore attribute. Um, and th the function has been declared at the top of the file here. So we can just call factorial.code. And then we can immediately access the, the name, the constants, um, the variable names, and also the bytecode which is a little hint at what's coming up. So if I run the first part of this script, um, you can see the name of the function is factorial, coming from here. 
The function constants are one, two, and none. So the constant one is actually used three times in this function. And the constant two is used twice. Um, none isn't used at all, but as far as I can tell, it's just in the constant list for every function. So I think um, that's just an extra element of the tuple for that field. Then we have a list of all the local variables and parameters in this function. And for this one, it's just n, which is the only parameter. If there were more local variables, they'd also show up here. Um, and then we have um, the bytecode for the function. So um, this is the actual, well, this is a binary encoded string, um, which contains the actual bytecode that represents this factorial function in Python. Um, and so then the next part of this presentation is to ask what we can do with this bytecode. Um, and what we can do using another built-in feature of Python is to um, disassemble this bytecode and take a look at what's happening. So it's very simple. We use the same um, code object here, and we just use the the dis module, which is built into Python, and we just call dis dot disassemble on the code. Um, and that looks like this. So this is a bit um, difficult to read. So I thought I'd just step through it quickly and explain like what's happening here. Um, but basically, you can see sort of five blocks of code here. So there's one here, there's a second one here, third one here, a fourth one here, and a fifth one here. And these roughly correspond to the lines of code in the function on the left. Um, that's not how it has to be. It's just how this example has worked out. But it's um, useful to compare them in this particular example that way. So here, for example, you can see it's loading a variable called n, and it's loading a constant called 1, and it's performing a less than or equal operation. And then it's going to branch based on the result of that operation. So this just corresponds to the first line here, where you have you have n, you have 1, you compare them, and then you branch based on that using the if statement. Um, and then for the second block, we load the constant 1 and we return it, which is just this line here, return 1. Um, the next two blocks are like fairly similar in what's happening. Um, they load the variable, the constant, and do a comparison, which is this line here. And then in the next case, you load the constant 2 and return it, which is line 4. <clears throat> um, and then finally, this last block is a bit longer. Um, and it actually, you can see the use of the stack um, happening. So it's going to load in all the um, relevant data first. So it loads in the variable n. It loads in a global variable called factorial, which is the name of the function. It loads in n again for a second time. And then it loads the constant 1. So this is it building the stack. And then it goes backwards and applies all the operations to get the value. So first of all, it does a binary subtraction, which is this bit here. Then it calls the function factorial, which is this bit here. And then it does a binary addition, which is the whole expression. And then it returns that value, which is the, the full statement here, return n 
plus factorial of n minus one. Um, so I hope that gives you some context for what this um, disassembled bytecode actually means. So um, the next step is to ask, what can we use this um, these blocks of code um, that we've like that we've taken from the bytecode? What can we use them for? Now, what we can use them to do is create a control flow graph which represents um, our Python function. So what is a control flow graph? Um, um, yeah, so, um, well, a graph in general is a set of nodes connected by a set of edges. And then a control flow graph in particular is a graph where the nodes are those blocks of code we were looking at, and the edges are the transitions between the blocks. So when you put it together, it forms this high level representation of your program and the different paths of execution that, that your program can take. So for example, in this, um, graph here, we have uh, a program which starts in one state, and then it can split up into two different paths. You can think of this as an if-else statement. Um, it can go into the left path or the right path, but after those two, it goes back into the original state. Uh, and then as another example, at the top right, um, we've got a program which will loop. Um, so this, you can think of this one as a while loop maybe. Um, it'll go, so it'll go between these two states in a loop um, before at some point breaking out and going to the final state here. Um, so yeah, you can think of all these different transitions between nodes as different types of control flow. So the, the most obvious one is a go-to statement, but there's also like if-else statements um, and while statements or return statements are all things which can affect the control flow of a program. Okay, so if we have this bytecode, this disassembled bytecode here, um, how can we construct a control flow graph for our function? So in reality, it's fairly simple. Um, we've got this the same uh, function code object from earlier. Um, we take the code field, which is just a byte string, um, and then quite simply, we just iterate through the whole string uh, using a while loop and examine each byte in turn. Um, so I'll, I'll go into this a bit, uh, not into too much detail, but just to explain what's happening. Um, so you iterate through each byte in the byte string. Um, if you encounter a return statement, so if the operation is a, a return statement, then we create quite a simple block. Uh, and this block just has the length um, that it takes up and this extra field called exit, which just marks as a return statement. It says, this is a block which um, exits from the function basically. And then we're only going to check one other other case, which is the um, an if else statement. So that's this comparison here. Um, there is also another consideration we have to take into account here, which is if the operation has an argument. So in Python bytecode, if an operation doesn't have an argument, then it's just one byte. But if it does have an argument, it's two bytes. 
Um, and of course, a, a branch statement has an argument because it needs to know where to branch to. So to check for branch statements, we need to check for like any uh, operation with arguments. Um, and that's to make sure they're properly aligned because they'll be coming in pairs of operations and arguments um, side by side. Um, so basically, if we know that this operation has an argument, um, we inspect that as well. We take its value and we just increment our counter by one to skip over to the next operation. Um, and if we do encounter this branch statement, we're going to create another block, uh, but slightly more complex this time. It still has the, the length like the return statement block. Um, but it's also got two paths that the execution can take. It can take the path along the con where the condition is evaluated as true, which is a jump to one point in the program. Um, and it can take the path where the condition is evaluated as false. And that's a, that's a branch to a different point of the program. So if I um, execute that next part of the script, we can um, find like the blocks that make up this, um, the bytecode for this function. So this is actually fairly similar to the disassembled code in structure in that it's made up of five blocks. And these five blocks, again, correspond to the five lines of code on the left. <clears throat> so the first, the first block is a, um, it, it's a branch. So you are, um, depending on the value of this condition, which is n is less than or equal to one, you can branch to different points in the program. So if it's true, you go to eight, which is this return one statement here. And if it's false, you go to 12, uh, which is this, which is the, the else if statement um, corresponding to this line here. Uh, then the, the second block is the, this is a, an exit statement. So it's the return, the first return statement here. And then we have another block representing an if else statement, which is the second one here, the elif. And again, you can see that if it's true, it jumps to this line here corresponding to return to and if it's false it jumps to this line here which corresponds to the final return statement n plus factorial of n minus one and then our final block is um is the longest it's also it's just the well, it's the recursive case, but it's the um, it's the final return statement um, corresponding to this return n plus factorial of n minus one here, and you can see that it's at point twenty four in the program. So this is a this is a JSON formatted version of the control flow graph. Um, but we might want to have, might want to be able to examine this and inspect it in a bit more of a user friendly format um, because this is a bit difficult to read at the moment. So, what I'm going to do is convert this into a dot file format, uh, which can be used to like generate a visual graph. Um, and I mean, this is the code for it here. It's not as interesting, so I won't go into it in, in detail. Um, but yeah, I'll just generate it now and show you what it looks like. 
So this is just a dot file representing the actual control flow graph. And if I take that and generate a graph with it, we can see that this is the control flow graph of the, um, the factorial program. Um, so yeah, let me download. And if we compare this side by side, um, we can see Yeah, okay, so we, we enter the function at the top here. Um, we then, the, the first thing we do is perform this, this branch, and it can be either true or false. If it's true, it goes to the first return statement. And if it's false, it goes through to another if-else statement. If that if, if else statement is true, it goes through to this return to here. And if it's false, it goes through to this um, uh, this, this uh, retu return statement here, which corresponds to the final return statement. Um, but in all cases, it comes through to this final return function. Um, so this sort of like visualizes all parts of execution through the factorial program, um, which I hope is like illustrative of like the quite powerful methods that Python gives you to um, examine the, the functions you have even at runtime. Um, because this is like quite high level information to have on a function like reta retained until runtime. Um, and it has some like, there's some quite useful things you can do with it. Um, so let's talk a bit more about that. So what now that we've generated this control flow graph for a function we've written in Python, what can it be used for? Well, when speaking about control flow graphs in general, um, they're very useful in uh, compiler design. So to be clear, this isn't something that we'd use um, this particular like control flow graph for because, well, I mean, this Python code is already compiled, right? So we don't really need to talk about compiler design here, but for control flow graphs in general, um, they're very useful for like um, data flow optimizations uh, for compilers. So as a couple of examples, um, let's say you've got um, a repeated expression in your program, just called A plus B. Um, you can inspect the control flow graph and you can say that through all possible paths of execution, um, the value of this expression or the value of the variable a and the value of the variable b will not be altered. So you can say that the value of the expression will also not be altered. And then with, using that information, you can apply an optimization, which is you can say that you're only going to calculate the expression once. So you, you do the addition a plus b once at the beginning, and then you just reuse that pre-calculated value. Um, similar to this is the idea of constant propagation. So let's say you have the expression three plus five in your program. Um, this is a like this is a constant expression. So rather than executing three plus five at runtime, you can just inspect that and replace it with eight um, at compile time. Um, and save yourself a couple of operations. But also, um, and the idea of propagation comes in here because that value itself, three plus five, could form a part of another constant expression, 
and that that and these like constant values can propagate throughout your program so it's important to have a control flow graph so that you can determine when expressions are altered or when variables are altered that affect expressions um so you can determine for what period they are constant for and therefore like for what period in the program for which blocks of execution in the program you can apply um optimizations for constant values and then a third type of optimization is dead store elimination so what you can do is you can find the assignment to a variable and then you can consult your control flow graph and you can see if on any of the different parts of execution after that assignment, is this variable, is it actually ever read from? Um, and if the answer is no, then you can just remove that assignment because it's, um, it's not necessary to assign to a variable that's never gonna be read. Um, so you can just optimize it away and delete the operation. So that's about compiler design. Uh, we might want to talk about something a bit more relevant to Python. Um, so a control flow graph would be useful for a static analysis tool, such as um, the MyPy type checker. Um, in particular, uh, it's useful for something called static single assignment form. Now, static single assignment form is the requirement that each variable is um, declared at most once. So you can't declare the same variable twice. Um, also with the requirement that you only ever read from the variable after it's been assigned to. So you can't ever read from a variable before it's been assigned to. And this is where the control flow graph comes in useful because you can look at all the different paths of execution that happen, and you can see if it's possible in one of those paths that you're reading from this variable before you've ever assigned to it. And in addition to that, you can check if it's ever actually read from at all, you know, um, if it's just an unused variable. Um, so you can also use a control flow graph to um, check for that case as well. Um, but yeah, that uh, that was quite a quick run through of um, introspection and control flow graphs. But I think it's very interesting um, how powerful the tools are that Python gives you to examine your functions even after the program has started running. Um, but that's the end of the talk. So are there any questions? Billy, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I'm actually just going to jump in and say that um, various people on the call do have to jump off at this stage. So I, what I suggest we do is we close the talk for now and we perhaps uh, go offline with some questions later. OK, but thank you very much for the talk. Yeah, fantastic. Um, thanks very much, everyone. Uh, thanks, Billy. Cheers, Thank you, Billy. Thanks. Thanks.